There's history here. And here. There's history there. History is everywhere. <laughs> the guy, this is whom we'll be talking about today. This is Pinto Kolvig. This picture is taken around 1944 when uh, when Pinto and Andrea Castellotti did a, a nationwide tour promoting the re-release of, of Snow White. And Pinto's holding a, a statue of Goofy because he, he created the character of Goofy and uh, was Goofy's voice until he died in 1967. Uh, and Goofy was actually modeled after, after a Medford resident. You have a question? Why was he touring for the re-release of Snow White? He was one of the voices of, of, uh, of he, actually he, he voiced Grumpy and he voiced uh, Dopey, I believe as well, two of, the, two of the dwarves I know. Grumpy was also modeled after a local character, after uh, a bartender named Stoughton P. Jones, he, he knew as uh, growing up in Jacksonville. Yeah. Uh, so, and uh, of course, but Pinto's probably best known for, for this, this character, Goofy. No, that's not Goofy, that's Bozo, whom we won't be talking all that much about. Partly because Bozo's kind of a, a mystery to me. There, there isn't a whole lot about early Bozo that I've been able to find in the newspapers. And partly because s subsequent to, to Pinto's tenure as Bozo, the character of Bozo was bought by uh, Larry Harmon, was it? I think that was his name. And he was the guy who, who, who syndicated Bozo, so you had Bozos all across the country doing, doing kiddie shows all across the country. But Pinto originated that. He was hired by Capitol Records to write and record the Bozo records, and I he was the first, first Bozo. Did you like them here? I have three of the Bozo albums. Uh, we'd, I, I, I think we have some of them, but you know, it would be great to have Bozo records that we could actually play instead of, instead of treating as precious artifacts that can only be touched with white gloves. We'd, donations are happily considered. You might want to wait until after the election to see if, if there will be, see, see what, what kind of historical society we'll have after November 8th. <laughs> but we, so we won't be talking about, about much about Bozo, we'll be talking about Pinto's early years, which came to light recently when I helped, tr helped discover the, the, the Judge Colvig papers, which were to, being preserved by one of his, uh, his descendants who, who wasn't all that interested in them and just had them stuck under, under the stairs. And in those letters, in those, the, the box are a lot of the early photographs and early letters of Pinto. Pinto was a local boy made good, and this is the town that created him, Jacksonville. Pinto was born in 1892. This picture was taken around 1890. Jacksonville at the time was 700 people, a small town, and that was the biggest town in the valley. It was a very, very uh, uh, re insular community. Ja the Jackson County had only recently been opened up to the rest of the world by the railroad. Before then, it was very, very remote. You know, you had to drive, take a wagon or horse for days to get to anything, to the, to the nearest civilization. Um, and this is what shaped his humor, and Pinto had admit, admitted that he was a very corny comedian, had, was not ashamed about using that term at all, never had any, any pretensions to sophistication. And of course, this is downtown Jacksonville. Looks a pretty much the same way today. And this is the Colvig House where Pinto was born. He was born in the ha in the house, and the house still stands on Oregon Street in Jacksonville. Um, this picture was taken in 1971. And in the box were were some early photos of Pinto. This is the first one, about around eight months of age, I guess. 1892 or three, and here he is about three years of age. And you can kind of get an impression from the next one that his family was pretty well off. They could afford to dress their son like little Lord Fauntleroy. I'm sure this is not what he looked like on a daily basis, certainly not judging from, from his reminiscences. He was a pretty, pretty
pretty rough and tumble kid. There's one story that survives. It was in the newspaper about uh, uh, a greengrocer who was driving his wagon in Met Jacksonville and his horse ran away, throwing the young young Colvig boy off into the bushes and and he was he was shaken but but basically unhurt and that so that was Pinto. You know, this was an era when you would allow your, your children to free range. You know, it's a small town, everybody knows each other, knows everyone's business. So apparent and we not only have Pinto's word that he was free ranging as a child, we have this one little newspaper story that as evidence, as corroboration. And here he is with uh, I don't know who the boy in the army outfit is, but that's his brother Don on the, on the banister, and Pinto is sitting on, on his father's lap, Judge Colvig. William Mason Colvig was a very well-respected lawyer, and like most well-respected lawyers, he acquired the sobriquet of judge. He was called, always called Judge Colvig, but he was never a judge. Pinto said that he was, the only thing he was ever a judge of was Irish whiskey. Pinto was, was a nickname. He was, he was uh, christened Vance DeBar Colvig. DeBar was the doctor who delivered him. And the story is that, that the, the doctor filled in the middle name and that was, you know, and then gave the certificate to his father and that was how he paid for the, for the, obst the obstetrical bill. This was pretty common at the time. He had lots of, uh, or well, lots, we had several children named after doctors. And this was an era when lots of children were given surnames as first names. There were Vance's. I don't, we don't know exactly which Vance Pinto was named after, but there was a Vance family. But he was called Pinto because of his freckles. And his, his schoolmates called him Pinto the Human Leopard. And here's a close-up of Pinto on his father's lap. Apparently a very loving relationship, but then the love comes, comes through in the letters that were in this big tin box. And here's Pinto all cleaned up about the age of 10 or 11, probably around 1903. He didn't look like this though. They didn't have airbrushes in those days, but they did have, use crayons and, and oil paint to, to smooth out, out the, 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 the freckles. And then this is Christmas 1904, and this is what Pinto really looked like, this freckle-faced, disheveled boy on the far right, who really didn't quite fit in with his much older, very accomplished siblings. He was the, the youngest, and um, which probably accounted for his closeness with his father. And Pinto's, uh, did I skip a picture? Yes. Oh. I need to pay attention to what I'm doing, I guess. Okay, so here's a picture of Pinto a couple years later, uh, riding his, his, his calf. Uh, Pinto was a, a town character. Later on, his, uh, one of his schoolmates reminisced that one summer Pinto organized a kid's circus, trained dogs, trapeze, snake man magician, and our willow whistle band played. Pinto was the band leader, black faced clown, and ringmaster with a big whip he would crack. As I remember, the admission was two stick of, sticks of gum or ten marbles, which was not his first theatrical experience. Pinto was kind of starstruck, which wasn't easy to do in a remote little town, but whenever a theatrical troupe would come to town or a circus, he would try to insinuate himself into the, into the performance, and he reminisced that he was successful sometimes, even managing to find him, his way on stage as, as an extra performer. But his r first actual professional experience was in 1905 when his father took him to the, the Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland. This is a photo of the trail, which was the, the midway. This is where all the, the, the side show and you know, the, all the, all the, the, the lowbrow entertainment of, of, the, of the exposition took place. And Pinto reminisced, when I was about 12, my dad took me to the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition, 1905, but I never got past the crazy house on the midway. I spent long and hard trying to find the, the crazy house on the midway because he capitalized it. There was no crazy house, so it had to be the, this, the Temple of Mirth. But Pinto remembers there was a guy outside beating a drum and roaring, hubba, hubba. I went up to him and told him I could play squeaky clarinet. Okay, come back tomorrow and I'll give you a listen, he said. No, sir, I'll be back today. And I ran back to the hotel for my clarinet. 
I went to work that day just squawking. And the next day, the guy put the clown white makeup on me for the, for the first time. Then he, he made me put on an old derby and some big old clothes, and he stepped back and took a look at me. Now you make a good bozo, he said. Bozo was the term for, for a tramp clown like, like Emmett Kelly. I got four bits a day and all the goop I could eat, like popcorn and peanuts. And his dad was probably happy to be able to go through the expo without Pinto tagging along. And I've looked long and hard for, for pictures of, of this little kid playing clarinet in front of, the, front of the Temple of Mirth. So far, they haven't turned up. I also look, hoping to find a picture of Hubba Hubba, but a blow up of this is probably the best we'll ever, ever get of, of Hubba Hubba, the clown who introduced Pinto to clowning. The next year, 1906, was a big year for the Colvigs. That's the year they moved to Medford. This is their house, which was on, on Laurel Street, right across the, the street from where the courthouse is today. Back then, that, the courthouse site was occupied by Washington School, where Pinto went to school. And uh, what could be better for a 14-year-old freckle-faced kid than to be living on Main Street in the biggest town in the valley? And not only the biggest town, but the town that it was in the process of quadrupling in size in, in the space of five years. This is Main Street in Medford, just a few blocks from Pinto's house. That's the depot on the right. Pinto recalled loving hanging around the depot and got to know everyone who worked at the depot. And later he would work there very briefly. And that's contemporary to I beg your pardon? That photo is contemporary to his life. Yes, that that's, picture was taken in 1909. And you can see how busy it is. People, streets, sidewalks thronged with people because of this huge real estate boom that, that the entire Jackson County was going through at the time. And uh, what could be better? And here's a picture from the next year, 1910, just as busy in 1911. And this is all going on just a few blocks from Pinto's house, which, which might explain is one of the reasons that Pinto was not all that excited about school. This is Pinto's classroom. And Pinto has a way of, of standing out in every group picture he takes. That's, he didn't need to make an arrow. He's the only one who's half asleep with his face partially obscured by his hand. He was an indifferent student. In a 1917 letter to his nephew, Pinto explained that what he was suffering from was called cartoonitis. Cartoonitis is a peculiar malady which affects me, uh, which affects one at about the age of seven or eight years. Like, like tuberculosis and housemaid's knee, it is a germ for which there is no cure until death alone stops the hand which guides the pen. The first symptoms are that upon close observation, one will find crude looking Stone Age drawings in the victim's school books. And one of his school books survives. It's in a box in the library here. It's, a, it's an ancient history school book. And you can see from Pinto's illustrations how interested he was in ancient history. That was the death of Pericles. Here's the reign of Hadrian. Not a sophisticated comedian at that age either. The ruined spendthrift, Catalina. The Punic Wars. Joe Dokes, which may be the prototype of a character he based on one of the employees of the of the of this railroad depot in Medford, whose name was Frank Wilkie. Later on he based a a, a vaudeville character on him he called the Oregon Apple Knocker, which was a, a hick your standard hick character. Uh, Frank Wilkie was uh, you know, the, 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 he was the flagman there. He, he guarded the crossing there in the days before automatic signals. And he, the job usually went to a retiree or an amputee, someone who, you know, it was a, a charity job. Uh, Frank Wilkie was neither. He was a young, healthy, strapping young man, but, but he had been dropped on his head when he was five, so he was, he was dim-witted. And Pinto based this, this uh, hick character on Frank Wilkie, and that may be a, a, a caricature of him. Uh, in 1930, when Pinto went to work for Walt Disney, he did this character who had this a shambling gait, very happy-go-lucky nature, and a very distinctive laugh. And that became the genesis of Goofy. You know, Goofy was created by Pinto Colvig based on a Medford character. Can you do the laugh? I, I beg your pardon? Can you do the laugh? Can I do the laugh? Yuck, yuck, yuck. 
Any, everyone can do a goofy laugh. I'm not going to do it on tape, though. So we're going through this 1908 school book of Pintos. There's the, his character of Herodotus. And a little modern art thoughtfully dated for us, September 29th, 1908, beginning of the, the school year. And in those school years, he also played on the, on the school band. I didn't bring a pointer, but this is, this is his brother, Don. who also played clarinet, and Pinto is two over from his, from his brother, the only one with his hat tilted, looking askance at the, at the camera. And another, we have another picture of the, the Medford band, and it's kind of a similar situation. Don is standing second from the left, and Pinto again has his hat tilted, and this time he seems to be a little put out, maybe because he wasn't allowed to stand in the front row. We don't know. And about this time, his father sent Pinto and Don both to Portland to, uh, to a business college where Pinto took drawing lessons. This is the first drawing he sent home from, uh, from Portland. Uh, you can see his, his signature, V. Kolvik, in the, in the left. He spent, did a lot of experimentation with his signature in these days. And uh, there's a little Met Metford Mail Tribune story that says that Vance, for a number of months, has been dabbling more or less with, less with his pencil and recently went to Portland to take up the matter seriously. He now hopes to develop his talent to a point where it will be of some commercial value. I hope soon to be a member of a class Homer Davenport is thinking of giving in Portland, states Vance. I am number one on his list and I hope he will decide to open a studio. Homer Davenport was a big deal in the time. He was a nationally known political cartoonist. Um, the class may not have materialized. I haven't found any mention of it, but he did give a series of lectures in Portland, and you, we can presume that Pinto was there. Uh, here's a letter f he sent home three months later, signed completely different signature, and for the first time, he's drawn a little horse next to his, uh, his signature, a freckled horse, which he developed into a character he called Pinto's Nightmare and would appear on, on all of his uh, cartoons uh, in, for the next 10 years. And then uh, three months after this, in, in July of 1910, a little tiny notice in the Mail Tribune says, Vance Kolvig has forsaken cartooning for a while and will take a position with the Southern Pacific in the local depot. His father was a lawyer for the Southern Pacific. You can just read through this, that this was not Pinto's idea. And his father's probably trying to ground Pinto, you know, giving, either making him be more serious about cartooning or more serious about working in the real world. This apparently didn't last very long. The last, next year, 1911, Pinto is in college with Don again in Corvallis at the Oregon Agricultural College, the predecessor to OSU. And there's an article in the OSU uh, uh, newspaper in, the 19, in 1955 uh, says that Pinto, in Pinto's case, the term student was a magnificent overstatement. Except for the band, and here's a picture of Pinto in the band, he really took none of his courses seriously. The records show him taking drawing one, auditing it for one semester, and getting a C in the second. In the near 19, 12, year 1912 to 1913, he signed up to for 12 crisp credits in history and art courses, but didn't finish any of them. His was a light-hearted approach. Every spring, off to the circus or vaudeville, he wrote. Which is the beginning of his career of lying to journalists. He didn't go off to the circus or vaudeville every spring, which we'll get into. Uh, he toured with the circus for only two summers. And he also conf inflated his, 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 his uh, college career into having graduated from OAC, when we see here that he, he only completed one course. So there's a little difference between completing one course and a, f a full course for four years. And uh, oh, it doesn't show up on the screen, but again, Pinto Kolvig is showing up is in, this, uh, in this group picture. He's the only one who looks like he's hung over. And we just noticed that inside his makeup case, his tin makeup case back there, he has this, this photo pasted in. With OAC, he, he did his did, got into commercial art. He, he did illustrations for the, for the yearbook and the student newspaper. 
and probably for, for some local businesses, we, we, the commercial art I found of here is, is, isn't dateable or not easily dateable. Um, and he also sent commercial art home, sent political car cartoons home to the Medford Mail Tribune, which were, would typically be printed on the front page. This one's from 19, 1912 about uh, Med Medford's explosive growth during the last four years, the last five years. And uh, of course, the title says, How That Boy Does Grow. You know, of course, what Pinto couldn't have known is that the boom went bust just a couple, couple months later. And the, the, the cartoon from 1912, the April of 1912, just four months later, is uh, sh illustrating the, that the boom has gone bust and there's an election for, for county judge. And the two candidates have different, different opinions as to what to do about the ailing Jackson County uh, uh, economy in the center of, of the illustration there. And he did, uh, here's one that he did uh, a political cartoon about the, the, the Phoenix speed trap. They had a six million mile an hour speed limit in Phoenix, which made a lot of autoists unhappy. And here's the 1913 New Year's cartoon showing that it's, it's, it, the boom is over. It's, it's, everyone knows the boom is over and it's, those years are gone forever. Um, and here's some of the art that he did about this time. Uh, you can see Pinto's, Pinto's nightmare has developed into a, to, into a full character. And he's already calling himself a breakbeam tourist, painting up the, this, this history of being a hobo, of hoboing for years. Well, you know, he's, he's a kid. He's not even 20 years old. And he's, uh, he's, he's painting himself as, a, as, a, uh, as, as an experienced hobo. He did reminisce that when he was a, a, a kid, when he was you know, like pre-teen years, he would hop a freight train and ride up to, to Canyonville or, or to the Siskiyous, which was something t kids did at that, that time, but that's not exactly hoboing around the country, which is what he claimed. And uh, during his OAC years, he also toured with the, uh, with the Agricultural College Band. Pinto did this illustration. This ad ran in the Medford Mail Tribune. And with the, the band, he not only played his clarinet, this, I guess this is a self-portrait of Pinto. He also performed his vaudeville act. And uh, from the descriptions, apparently the vaudeville act was, was actually successful. Uh, we have uh, two descriptions of it. One from the Ashland Tidings says that uh, P Vance Kolvig, billed as Pinto the Nightmare of Caricature, was a star of the first magnitude. Kolvig made a few scratches that formed nothing in particular said a few magic words, made a few more scratches, and a fine likeness of Teddy Roosevelt, or Mutton Jeff, or finally Pinto the Nightmare would, would appear. Cole Vig is a hummer with real ability, and his stunt will prove tremendously popular ever, anywhere. Um, and then the, the, another newspaper said just about the same thing. For 15 minutes, Pinto, known off the stage as V.D. Colvig, no one called him VD, understandably, of Medford, kept the audience interested and in the best of humor with his caricatures and witty sallies. He's certainly gifted both as a cartoonist and as a comedian. In those days, this was kind of one of the standard vaudeville acts, either a chalk talk or on a big pad of paper, artists would draw drawings and, and say humorous things. And Pinto was setting him up for, himself up for a career doing just that. And actually, uh, just a few months after this, this tour with the Agricultural College, he, he gets, a, uh, gets a berth on, a, on the vaudeville circuit and writes to his father, Dear Dad, this has been in my mind for over two years and the only way I can get it out is to do it. I've seen so many cartoonists in vaudeville that really got their $100 a week. And they did nothing but draw four or five common pictures and say a few lines. I talked to two or three of them, and they said they really saved money, but the work got tiresome after a few months. Now keep that in mind, tiresome after a few months. How, how is that going to fit into what we know about Pinto Colvig? This is a kid who craves excitement. And I've looked long and hard for evidence of this, his, his career in vaudeville, in professional vaudeville, and this is all I've been able to find. One Salem newspaper did actually bill him 
pretty high billing and he, I don't know how he, he did that because he was a com complete unknown in vaudeville. And other than that, uh, he left no mark on vaudeville at all and this was his entire vaudeville career, maybe six weeks long. He did make his way in vaudeville up to Seattle um, and in May of 1913, as Pinto wrote much later, he said, before the end of the second term at OAC, the springtime and show business beckoned again. Not again, for this is the first time. I did a stint on the Pantages vaudeville circuit. When playing in Seattle, the Al G. Barnes Circus Parade passed the theater. I recognized some old friends on the clown bandwagon. I wanted to ramble. One day stands. That day I signed with Barnes. So, so as he himself had kind of anticipated, doing the same act night after night in vaudeville, you know, just a few minutes at a time and having the rest of your day to yourself and not anything to do was no life for Pinto Colvig. So he joins the circus. And these are Barnes circus posters from, from the teens. We only have one picture of P Pinto from the 1913 tour. This is taken in, uh, it would be June 29th, 1913. There's Pinto on the far right. And uh, after, but after less than six weeks with Barnes, Pinto writes to his father, well, my wild and checkered career as a trooper has come to an end, thank the Lord. Eight band men quit last night, owing to the fact that there were too many hippodrome bugs, bed bugs to sleep with. The food was starting to decrease in flavor. There was too much scandal and dirty work being displayed by the management. But watch me, Dad. This is the turning point of my life. I'm here thousands of miles from home, have nothing, and don't know a soul. The basement of my pants has worn out, caused from sliding to and fro on the bandwagon seats. But I'm going out tomorrow and get a job. Don't care if it's juggling horse apples in the street. This is in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So he's going, and so he gets a job in, in Cedar Rapids paving in the heat of an Iowa summer, paving the streets in Cedar Rapids. Writes, his, writes to his letter, ran my shoes off for three days looking for something to do. Started to work this morning for a paving company. Nine hours a day in, this, in the heat of an Iowa summer. And that lasted less than a month. A month later, another letter from home on the letterhead of the Consolidated Roman Carnival Companies. Writes to his father, well, the piccolo and bass players of Barnes Band and myself signed up yesterday with the above company at, at $12 per week, board and birth. My reason for doing it is that they are working westward. In a 1926 article, Pinto wrote, he described this, uh, this circus. He said the carnival featured a Roman circus and our uniforms had Julius Caesars looking to their laurels. We opened in Cheyenne and went broke three weeks later in Colorado Springs. So this is Pinto, Pinto's first year with the circus. His first year with the circus is about two months. Did more, found, made his way back to, to, uh, to, to Oregon. We don't know how. Maybe he actually hoboed his way back. Maybe he got money from, from his father. A lot of these letters, he's asking for money for his father. This is probably from 1913, some commercial art uh, that he did for Zans Brooms, which was a Portland company, a broom manufacturer. And uh, then he made his way back to, to Bedford by 1914. And this is a, in, in March of 1914, he was working for the Coronet Veterinary Company who in Medford was making horse medicine and, uh, and publishing uh, veterinary books. And there's Pinto's nightmare as well. That didn't last very long either. This time it was actually interrupted by, by a legitimate reason. He, he got <laughs> appendicitis, which for which he was operated on at, at Sacred Heart Hospital. Then, he's, then we have this mysterious gap. We, the br brief mentions that he's in Eugene, then he's in Portland. We don't know exactly what he's doing. But during this time uh, in, in 1914, the Eugene Guard, re predecessor to the Register Guard, writes a story about J Judge Kolvig, Pinto's father, and mentions Pinto in one paragraph. He says, it says, young Kolvig ran away from college a year or so ago and joined a circus with which he spent a year. And later he made good on the Pantages vaudeville circuit as a comedy sketch artist. 
Judge Kovig is very proud of his son in spite of the original way which, which the latter chose to gain an education. So Pinto has learned to lie to, to, uh, to journalists and this, this actually saw him in pretty good stead because you know, he's, he's an entrepreneur, he's an ent entertainment entrepreneur and you don't want to tell, paint a picture of hard times to journalists, you always want to puff yourself up to be bigger than life and this is something that, that was very successful for him. And then, so a few more months passed in September of 1914, this picture and story runs in, this, in the Oregonian, announcing that Pinto has a job. And there's no explanation in the story or anywhere else in the Oregonian why this is news. Who Pinto Kovig is, why we should know about him, or why we do know him in, in Portland, but they, they go to all this effort. Uh, and the job that Pinto has, has secured is in Carson City at a brand new newspaper, the Nevada Rock Roller. And I think this is, the newspaper was just a few weeks old when, this, when Pinto took up with them. And one of the gaps in my research is I have not tracked down issues of the rock roller to find the work that Pinto is doing. You got that one. This was in, 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 yeah. in Pinto's, I, I forget, this is, I think yeah, there are clippings of this here at SOHS. This is a, a, a complete paper that was in that, that the tin box. And uh, Pinto reminisced later that the editor of the rock roller was sent to the pest house with smallpox. So this didn't last long either. And I landed in Carson City as a cartoonist for the Carson City News during a legislative session. And as this letter shows, he's asking his dad for money again. And one of the products of, of, the, of his time in the, the Nevada State Capitol was, was this book, which, which is here. This is in the SOHS collection. And uh, it, again, there's, there's the, the nightmare and it has illustrations uh, caricaturing the the various personages and dignitaries in, in, the, in the Carson City legislator, Legislature. Now this is not representative of Pinto's best work. Pinto was never a really get great cartoonist, but the way he did this and his work at the Rock Roller and the Carson City News was by what was called the, the scratch plate method. You'd prepare a, a layer of, uh, of chalk, of, of plaster rather, over, over a tin sheet of steel and then you just scratch out the image. So all this lettering had to be done backwards. And uh, as you can see, you know, scratching in chalk is not exactly conducive to fine art. And then you'd, you'd pour hot molten you know, type metal over this and wash away the, the, the plaster. And then you print directly from that type metal. Um, so what's next? And then here's his last Carson City cartoon. Uh, and now, you know, bidding farewell to Carson City because the circus is in town. He writes back to his letter, to his father rather, saying, geez, I didn't know how badly criticized I'd be at home for joining with the show again. Anything, I wouldn't have thought anything about it. But the show's much larger and better now, and the trouble in 1913 makes them appreciate a good band now. I get $11 a week and nothing to pay for but my laundry. And this time we actually have a couple pictures of him w with, uh, with, with Barnes. This, that's the top of that helmet picking up there is Pinto's helmet. So that's one of the bandwagons that he slid back and forth out and wore out the basement of his pants. And here's another, here's a group picture of the Carson, uh, of, the, of the Barnes band. This picture was taken in, uh, where was it? In Idaho, and I don't think I wrote it down here. Um, so then we have another, uh, no, there's a little bit more. Uh, this is, yeah, this is in Wallace, Idaho. And once again, Pinto is standing out. He's the only, he's, this time he seems to be a little put out either with, I don't know, the circus management or having to get up in the morning to have his picture taken. We don't know, of course. And uh, so he stays with, with Barnes and makes his way back to Medford and all indications are that he, he jumped the circus when he got back to Medford. So this is his second year with, with the circus. His second year with, with the circus is about three months long. Apparently he deserts the circus in, in, in Medford. 
And now we have another maddening gap in Pinto's, Pinto's uh, uh, history. We don't know anything from what happened to him in December of 19, uh, September of 1915 and then 1917, except that somehow in April of 19, 1916, he gets married in Portland. We don't know why or how he met his wife, anything like that. Then the next thing we know about Pinto, he's in, in 1917, he's in San Francisco making cartoons. He's a pioneer animator making advertising cartoons. This is the same era when Walt Disney is in Kansas City doing exactly the same thing, making advertising cartoons, which would be shown before the feature in, in movie theaters. He writes to his father, I'm drawing 10,000 pictures per day, and I've been doing advertising scenarios for the company, and in my spare time, I draw on my nightmare. So he's got side projects at home, apparently animating his, his, his uh, a project involving his, his horse. He says, the office is busier every day and we will soon occupy the whole top floor, put in two more cameras. Harry Hicks wants the nightmare films when they're done. He says he has a place for me in Chicago when I learn the business. Of course, that didn't happen. And we have a picture of, of the studio. This is the animated cartoon film corporation. These four guys. From the left, we get, have Angel Esboy, who went on to a career in fine art. You can find his paintings on online. Tack Knight was a very good cartoonist, had a syndicated cartoon strip called Lil Folks. Uh, it was a pretty good strip, but it's, it's best known now because uh, I think in the, f in the 50s, another fellow wanted to start a, a cartoon strip uh, in about a group of small children, and he wanted to call it Lil Folks, but he couldn't use that name because it was taken already, so he had to call his strip Peanuts. And there's Pinto standing. And, and Byington Ford, who became a lifelong friend, is, is at the animation frame. And uh, he named one of his sons Byington. And you can see what Byington Ford is holding. What he, he's holding a paper cutout, and this is how they did their animation. This is, animation was still being invented in these days. And uh, I don't know if anyone was doing cell animation, you know, celluloid, where they would draw on celluloid sheets. Uh, I haven't done that, that research. But this is how they did a pretty quick and dirty process. And the camera is above Byington's head there. And, uh, and in the background through the doorway, you can see their, their dark room with a, a safe light hanging. And the big, that big drum is what they dried the film on. And of all those drawings, they, uh, uh, all those cutouts, only a few of them survive. We don't know where these are. This, we have a photocopy of this in the collection here at the Historical Society. Pinto put this piece of paper together in the 60s, commemorating one of the projects they did, which, was, which, which is pretty well acknowledged to be the world's first feature length cartoon. Uh, Pinto created this collage in 1965 uh, a little in advance of the 50th anniversary. The collage says that these three figures on the photocopy there are original composite drawings used in the world's first feature length animated cartoon. The title was Creation. Before Disney, radio and television, conceived, executed, and produced by Tack Knight, Pinto Kolvig, and Byington Ford. Besides Creation, we produced hundreds of animated film ads and equal to today's TV commercials for which we received one dollar per foot. And also in the collection here, we have an earlier creation collage. Again, that's, that's Pinto on the left, Tack Knight in the middle, and Byington Ford on the right. And I've, as far as we know, that's an original collage. And those five frames glued to the collage are all that survives of creation. Were the first feature length. What? This is the collection? That's here, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in, in MS7, I think. Yeah. Um, and uh, and when this tin box turned up, the, it was, there were lots of little envelopes, and I, I opened up one of the envelopes and poured it into my hand, and it was more frames, frames of film. I think, oh my god, more of creation. And it's more of the same. They're, they're adjacent frames to these frames. So what was creation all about? We don't know. And we have the title frame. Now, it might have been satirical. A couple of years before this was produced, there was a big production 
under the same title. This may have been a takeoff in that, we don't know. Here's Pinto, of course, in live action, and here's Pinto maybe pondering a creation, we don't know. And of all those hundreds of thousands of drawings they did, other than the cutouts, this is all that survives. And it looks like they were doing cell animation at this, at this time. Again, this is all we have to go on. And in his, one of his memoirs, which, is, uh, which was recently published, is right here, and you can buy a copy after the talk. It's called It's a Crazy Business. Pinto talks about his years with, Di with Disney and warns Walt Disney what's going to happen after his success is over. Warns Walt Disney what's going to happen to Snow White when people are tired of it and don't want to see it anymore. He g gives this long description. He's going to take it to a back alley where there will be a guy with a big vat and all the, f all the original at negatives of Snow White and, the, original and the, the film of Snow White is going to go in this vat to soak off the silver to re reclaim it for its silver content. And I suspect that's what happened to creation and that's what happened to all those other hundreds of animation projects that they did. Because no one wanted to see them anymore. He didn't wait for TV. Uh, so in 1919, Pinto gets tired of animation. He gets very tired of animation. His letters make that abundantly clear. He takes a J-O-B, he's working working for a newspaper, again, working at the San Francisco Bulletin, where he becomes the self-described bulletin board, bullet, not bullet, this self-described bulletin boob. And here he is boobing around. And with the, with the bulletin, he creates a character, he does a, a, a column, a daily column, in which the central character was, uh, was a thinly disguised pinto, called the, the, the Duke of Windy Gap. Windy Gap was a thinly disguised Jacksonville, although Windy Gap was supposed to be a, a Nevada town. And here's a caricature of Pinto shaking hands with his alter ego. And this, uh, this strip ran for 203 episodes in nine months, and all the episodes are on my website. You can take a look at them. And here are a couple more. Sometimes he'd have He'd appear in the, in, the, in the column in real life. There's, of course, that, that's Pinto being confront, confronted by a visiting opera star, and the, the Duke of Windy Gap is down there in the bottom. And here's Pinto, the new father. And, it, and this is kind of, kind of mysterious because this looks just like a letter that he had sent to his father a couple of years previously. So is this Pinto's memory at work? because I don't imagine that he had this. Maybe he, he'd kept a, a preliminary sketch of this. Um, let's see. There are two babies there. He eventually had five children, five sons. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He, so, so a baby's been added. Interesting. And in the San Francisco years, he also gets involved in, in movie production, in live action movies. And he reminisces that he, he got to know Frank Capra, who was making movies in San Francisco. And uh, if this, if the, the text under this illustration can be believe, believed, Pinto actually performed in this movie called A Tramp There Was. There's no historical reference to that movie. There's no historical reference to, to the director, Jack McHenry. There's his, his, uh, his uh, uh, caricature there. There's very little uh, recorded about the San Francisco movie scene at all. Uh, there, someone did write a book about it, which mentions neither the movie nor Jack McHenry. But it looked Jack McHenry in the 1920s census, and he was described as a movie, movie director or, or producer, something to do with film in, in the census. So, this is not invented. This, is, this all actually did happen. It just didn't make it into the history books. And uh, there's Pinto on the far right working at, working at the bulletin. And then 1921, the very next year, again out of the blue, a letter to his father. All papers and agreements have been signed up, the office space rented, camera being built, and preliminary work in general is being rushed. The company will be called the Pinto Cartoon Company. Pinto Cartoon Comedies. And uh, 
you know, I don't know. He, he writes his father, will surely be a busy feller during the next few weeks, but 24 hours work a day will seem a pleasure to me. You know, just two years later, late, earlier, he was writing to his father how tired he was of animation, how tired he was of 24 hours a day work, you know, drawing all these hundreds of thousands of drawings. But he says, when I hold the thought that my best friend, Byington Ford, is behind me, you know, that he's being supported by all these, these wealthy men, this, this, is, this is what he wants at the moment. Oh, okay, three, he's, okay, yeah, he's up to, th up to three sons. <laughs> but then, this, do, this only lasts a year, in 1922, June to, oh no, okay, before, bef with Pinto Cartoon Company, they did a, a local promotion, they, they showed a lot of their cartoons, or several of their cartoons, to, to local theater audiences, and this was published to, to, uh, to promote it. And it, it looks like Pinto's work, you know, it looks like Pinto's composition, but you can see that the actual drawing is much more finished. And you look in the corner, it says Pinto and Tack, and you can see that Tack actually did the ink work on this. Tack was a much more, much more finished, much more accomplished artist, Tack Knight. But June, 19, June of 1922, he goes to work for uh, uh, Oh, oh he, well, he syndicates this, this cartoon strip called Life on the Radio Wave, which runs June through October of 1922. And uh, the premise of this was, it was, you know, uh, satirizing the, the brand new American obsession with, with radio, which was, you know, this was, radio was brand new. This is before radio speakers, you know, people sat with their radio sets and, and headphones on. And uh, so it was, it was brand new, and Pinto was on, was on the crest of this wave. And some of them are actually amusing. But uh, the, the strip quickly devolved. He started following the, the adventures of, of one elderly gentleman who makes contact with a, with a flapper over the radio and carries on essentially you know, an internet romance, you know, sight unseen. He's romancing this woman, and of course it goes nowhere and, and very quickly results in the death of the comic strip. And then, once again, kind of mysteriously, 1923 finds him in Hollywood. He's moved from, from San Francisco to Hollywood. And in January of 1923, a trade magazine has a one-line mention says, Pinto, popular cartoonist of the United Features Syndicate and known from coast to coast, according to Pinto, has been made gag man for century comedy productions. And in the collection here, we have uh, a few headshots of Pinto, which makes it look like, look like he was an actor. I've been able to find no evidence that he, these movies were ever produced. I think these are headshots that he produced to take from, from place to place to get jobs be in front of the camera and maybe to show his, his uh, facility with, with makeup. We really don't know. And, and we don't know how he made it to, to, uh, uh, to Hollywood either. He does say in a 1926 article, this is the closest story, thing we have to how he ended up in Hollywood. He says that when he worked at the Bulletin, he used to take movie actors out to lunch and in writing up their stories, got to know them pretty well. They began to ask, why don't you come down to Los Angeles with the rest of the nuts? And they said it so often that the idea began to get inside his skin. After trying for six weeks, I finally got an interview with Jack White of the Jack White comedies. That was the beginning. And since that time, I've written scenarios, titles, subtitles, acted some seriously and in comedies, created gags, devised all sorts of funny pieces of screen business, created sets for 25 weeks at Fox, and now have a two-year contract with Max Sennett. Much of that work is, is lost, like, like most silent comedies, but some of them survive. Here's an ad that, that played of a film that, that played in, in Medford, Keep Going. That film is lost, but you can see he got big play up in, in the local papers because this was our local boy returning home in celluloid form. And he, did perf he wrote titles and was a gag man in perf in, for all of the Buster Brown comedies, for century comedies, and performed in a couple of them. This one's lost. This was called O Teacher. That's Pinto, of course, circled. And down at the bottom is his son, Vance Jr. 
who also performed, I guess, as one of, this, one of the students. We don't know much about that film. This one does survive, though. This was the picture from a trade magazine. This was called uh, O oh Buster. That's Pinto on the far right. He played the butler. And the, fi the film survives. And um, I think I have it with me. I can put it on your, th on your thumb drive if you want it, want to take it home. It's not very good. But one, one interesting thing about this is that it has several examples of Pinto's animation. Because Pinto was not only working in front of the cameras and behind the cameras, he was continuing to do animation. So if a gag was impossible, Pinto would draw it on the frames itself. And so if you see you know, a, a movie from 19, a silent movie from 1925 to 1927 where uh, the hero is chased by a swarm of bees. It's very likely that Pinto painted those, those bees on, on, the, on the film. In O Buster, there's one scene where uh, someone, I forget what he, he sits on a dynamite or something, is blown hundreds of feet in the air and then comes back down to earth. And when he's in the air, those are all drawn on the film by Pinto. And in his book here, he, he he mentions by, he describes several other gags that he did, some of which still survive on film. So that's what he did in, 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 the, in the 20s. Um, and then sound came along, and first, and once again, Pinto is on, you know, right there on the crest of the wave. And in 1928, he, uh, he uh, partners with a guy named Walter Lance, who is now known for Woody Woodpecker, right? and creates the character Bolivar the Squawking Ostrich, or Bolivar the Talking Ostrich. The, the name, is, name, name changes from one account to the next. And uh, it was intended to be a, a talking cartoon, but apparently sound was never added to the cartoon. Uh, apparently the film was completed, though. Pinto later explained that I played the part of a goofy, wandering minstrel clarinet player in live action, while Bolivar, my partner, was a bow-legged cartooned ostrich. Bolivar was a pest and I couldn't get rid of him. When I tooted my clarinet, he danced and sang. During a certain passage in the music, he leaned over and gave me a peck on the head. Resenting this, I put down my clarinet and while I was rolling up sleeves to take a poke at him, he picked up the clarinet in his beak and ran over the horizon. I hope there was more going on in the cartoon than that. Uh, and, but in Pinto's book about his animation career, he describes screening this footage for Walt Warner Brothers and doing the sound effects live. He says, Leon Schlesinger and Jack Warner seemed to get a kick out of it. I could hear them laughing and it made me feel mighty good. Not until sometimes afterward did I learn that during the showing of the film, they'd kept their eyes on me watching my wild antics while supplying the sounds. They'd forgotten to look at the cartoon. And the last Pinto ever heard about Bolivar was that the Japanese rights had been sold for $90. So maybe somewhere in Japan there's a, a print that survives a Bolivar. Then in 1930, he goes to work for Disney. Disney's getting into sound too. Pinto goes to work as a, a sound man and a gag man. And this is his first, uh, this is his 1930 Christmas card with the five Pintos and, and Mickey Mouse as well, his five sons. And we have a, a picture of, from 1931 of Pinto at work. This is a studio recording ses session, and this is how they did it in the building. In the beginning, they uh, screened the cartoon and did all the sound live in one go. Quite an operation. You can see there's, the, there's Walt Disney in the upper left-hand corner and the sophisticated recording equipment. The singing group in another corner. There's the, some of the sound effects equipment. There's a siren on a, mounted on a bicycle wheel and a, a tub for thumping, or a, you know, a, a barrel for thumping, I guess. The sound effects table, you got marimba, xylophone, clackers, cowbell, and other unidentifiable objects. And then in the back, there's a guy baying at a, at a microphone, microphone hanging over him. And over in the band, there's Pinto playing his clarinet next to Walt Disney. And, 19 th and with Disney, C Pinto wrote, co-wrote Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? The, these are the original lyrics. This is in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum. 
And in 1933, he, he toured with, uh, with the other voices of the other pigs, doing radio shows and performing, doing, doing the voices. And it looks like during these shows, Pinto provided the sound effects. He's holding the flute for the, that was used in, during the song, and there are sound effects equipment down there. And this, this picture ran in newspapers all across the country. Then in 1934, they, they, there's a, Disney had a, a series of photos taken showing, you know, illustrating the, the, the life of a, ga of a gag man, the life, what well, goes behind the scenes at a cartoon studio. And uh, so Pinto features prominently in a lot of these pictures, and they are the most depressing pictures you'll ever see. They were taken between Thanksgiving and Christmas, taken after dark with all all artificial lighting and you can just see these people are exhausted and don't want to be there and just want to go home. Look at this guy. Except for Pinto. Pinto's, one of Ch Pinto's jobs as a, as a gag man was he, he would you know, use his expressive face to, to illustrate uh, uh, you know, emotions and, and uh, the other animators would copy his, his face. Would draw his. And here they are pretending to be interested in, in the in the, the, what do they call it, the, the panel showing the, the storyboard. The storyboard, thank you. And that's Pinto just to the right of Walt Disney. And here's another picture of the same scene and you can see that they've, they've moved, the, the, moved the furniture around. So these are all posed pictures and people are just exhausted and just want to go home. There's Pinto pointing at one of the, one of the storyboards. And this is, I think is Pinto's office. Those are the tools of Pinto's trade on the on the top of the piano, Pinto's clarinets. That's his trombone there. And there's Pinto at his desk. No idea. No, n don't know anything about the cat. And there's an ocarina behind him. We use the ocarina in, for sound effects. But now this picture is an actual storyboard session. And notice the difference in the energy. This is the this is the storyboard section session for. Uh, you know, a, a gag session for a cartoon which I've identified. Um, and I don't know why I'm bothering to look it up. This is for the grasshopper and the ants, during which, and Pinto wrote this, the theme song for grasshopper and the ant and did the, sound, did the voice for the grasshopper. But you can see the energy, you know, they're laughing, it's natural light, the light bulb is turned off. This time there's a guy at a typewriter, you know, or maybe it's a dictation machine, it must be a typewriter, you know, trying to capture the energy, capture all the ideas that, that are thrown out so nothing gets lost. This is what it was actually like. And of course, there's, Pinto has drawn an arrow pointing to himself, illustrating some emotion. Wrong way. Another thing with Pinto did was, you know, his biographies point, uh, make a big deal of this. That's Pinto on the far right, uh, in the, sitting in far right. He, was, he led the Mickey Mouse's cartoon band. This band was only put together for one event. In 1936, there was an event uh, for United Artists, I think. And here's another picture that's Pinto kneeling to the right of, of the drum. And the, this event took place at Pickfair, at Mary Pickford's ma mansion. And there's Pinto, again, just to the right of Mary Pickford. He always seems to get right next to the, to the, big per to the important person in an illustration. And that's Roy Disney standing two people to the left of, of Mary Pickford. And uh, this was about the time that, no, okay, in 1936, so that was 1936, and this was about the time when Pinto got fired from Disney. According to his book, Pinto went through a, 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 a what do they call it, nervous breakdown at the time. There are intimations elsewhere that, that his, his nervous breakdown took the form of alcoholism. Uh, we may never get to the, the bottom of that, but he was fired and took pic Disney pictures with him and used them to, uh, to promote his radio career. Uh, used, used them as, as radio headshots. He, he, he did the, the, the lettering on these, on these pictures with his credits. And then between his firing, or after he was fired, Snow White was released and Pinto took out this ad in a trade magazine 
which is more than a little bitter about his separation from Disney. The text says, congratulations to my former associates at the Disney Studios. The animators who so skillfully and faithfully interpreted my characterizations of the dwarves, and which brings us back to where we began, as Goofy, doing the Goofy voice and touring as Goofy.